Wow, full house. Okay, okay, guys, let's get started. I've um, been practicing this one in my room for the past two days. I think it's just about the right length, but if I wait too long, I might run out of time. So that being said, if you have any questions, just could you wait till the end and I'll see what I can do then. Alrighty, blimey, a full house. Okay, excellent. <laughs> no pressure. Okay, so let's see. I'm, gonna, I'm trying something different here. I've got my notes on one hand and the clicker on another hand, so we'll see how this goes if I screw it up or not. Okay, anyway. So, um, so welcome to Getting Your App Out There. Um, my name's Tim Oliver and I'm from Edith Cowan University in Perth, Western Australia. Um, basically, this is going to be a very beginner's sort of oriented kind of uh, presentation. Basically, I want to start off at, at the point where you've finished your app, you're just about to get it out in the App Store and just, just to try and let you know what to expect, what kind of pitfalls you might have, and then once it's out, on, out there and in the wild, what kind of stuff you can do to just get the word out, actually you know, get people to learn about your app and to download it, and then to actually help promote the app by engaging users and doing some other stuff later down the track, like localization and all that. So, just really quickly, Anvil Facts. Yes, okay, so I'm from, <laughs> suspense. So I'm from Edith Cowan University, uh, a little university in Perth, Western Australia. I work in the learning, uh, the learning center for my university, and normally my position is a web developer. So I work on the internal websites and help out with our main LMS system, which is Blackboard, good old Blackboard. And, um, and but on the side, I also do a lot of multimedia research um, and production. So I do a, a, a bit of lecture recording audio recording and recently um, we've been moving into mobile app development so I've been doing some mainly on the side for the time being but hopefully officially sooner, sooner or later uh, app development um, we're looking at doing some app development for our main website very soon so hopefully next year we'll be I'll be back with some some cool stories for that all right so okay what we'll be covering today so basically starting from the, the bare minimum uh, just a quick show of hands again who here has never submitted an app before yeah, okay, that's good. That's a good number. That's, if everyone had, I'd feel pretty newbie up here. So just really quick, I'm just going to talk about what to expect, uh, some tips for actually putting, and it's working, right? Uh, and putting your, um, your app as an entry onto the App Store. Um, setting up some app metrics tracking in addition to iTunes Connect to actually track how your app is going. Some really good stuff there you can actually do on your own outside of iTunes. Um, how to promote the app online. I think a lot of people are here for this. So just, just a couple of stuff, bits and tricks you can do. I think Russell mentioned quite a few today. Um, stuff that doesn't work, stuff, stuff that does work. I'll be offering, offering my perspective and experience on what I've done with my apps uh, and how that worked out. Uh, engaging users. So once the app is out there, you know, basically support. So once the app is out there and you know, people start finding stuff that's broken in it, they'll, they'll start coming. So how to actually do some damage control, how to actually make yourself really accessible for that. And yeah, there's well, good ways to just keep the app going well. Hey, ECU people outside. All right. And yeah, that's it. All right, so just a bit of a disclaimer. I'm going to be talking mainly from the iOS perspective. I'm mainly an iOS developer, but pretty much everything I'm going to say will, will port directly across to Mac, I think. But yeah, so just, just keep, keep in mind, I'm going to be going from iOS, but it will work fine on, on Mac as well. All right, so let me just talk a little bit about what I've been doing and, and basically where, where I'm coming from in terms of app development. Um, this time last year, I was a complete noob at anything Mac programming related. I was like exclusively Windows developing, so um, I actually came to the last dev world a complete noob, not knowing the difference between a view and a view controller. Good times. Um, so I actually did the, yeah, so I did the Cocoa Jumpstart cl class last year. That was at the uh, Ridges in the middle of Melbourne, the one that Lewis checked into um, this time. <laughs> hey, Louis. Um, and yep, yeah, and that was really good. Like, it was a, that thing, it's, it's, they're only a day, but they're really good because they, just, they give you a, a solid grounding and everything you need to actually just keep doing your own study from there. And I've heard the one that this year is even, even better, and that's not because Louis is standing right in front of me, or sitting right in front of me right now. Good. Anyway, thanks, nice save. Okay, so with that in mind, I actually went away and made my first app, and it was a really small little app. It was a currency converter app. I made an app originally that was basically a little currency converter that converted Microsoft points from Xbox Live to, you know, real money. Um, <laughs> and I called it, oh, good one. Uh, that's, I made, it's called MicroPoints. It's a little app, really easy, just one view controller, a whole part of IB outlets, just really easy. And I thought, well, it's an app. I could probably sell it and you know, become insanely rich off the App Store. Yeah, yeah, not so much. So I stuck that out at the price of a buck, hoping to you know, retire from this life of crime. 
Um, and it actually didn't do too badly. Like with, without, without doing any you know, p pushing or marketing or anything, like the app would sell on a good day, three, three a day, on a terrible day, none a day. But it's been doing that on and off for about a year now. And the cool thing is, with an app like that, that's enough to basically recoup your Apple developer subscription. So now I can actually make apps for free, which is actually quite nice, because um, this app is actually sustaining my app developer subscription. Um, so just having a couple apps like that out there is really good, just to make it so you don't actually have to keep putting more money in to continue doing your uh, app development. Anyway, after that, just before um, I went to Devo last year, I actually went on a youth exchange trip to Japan for two weeks. Oh, here's Tony. OK. Um, not, to, not to draw attention or anything. Um, and yeah, so basically, uh, I went to Japan for two weeks, had a great time. It was really hot over there. And just uh, mainly out of nostalgia and mainly out of the fact I saw them and, uh, you know, nostalgia and for the Japanese practice, I ended up buying a pile of Pokemon games. Anyone play Pokemon? Yes! I'm not the only one. Cool. Okay. So I was playing these games and I was thinking, man, this has changed a lot. And all the information's out there on Google, but I just got to keep going on my iPhone looking up the stuff on Google to play these games. And I was thinking, why don't I just make an app that just locally caches all that information, stores it on your iPhone in a nice accessible format? So fast forward another couple months, I made a small little app. I called it iPokedex. And this is a cool little app. It was just a SQLite database attached to a pile of view controllers. Um, and after MicroPoints, I realized that, yeah, just, just putting the app out there and hoping for the best doesn't really work. So I did a lot of research into actually finding out how you can actually promote the app, places you can actually talk about the app online, using things like Twitter and Facebook, even though Russell didn't really endorse them, but yeah, to try and get the word out a bit more. And after about four months, to my absolute shock and horror, because I, I was like, yeah, 10,000 downloads, it'd be great. For free, by the way, because I didn't want to get in trouble. It made a quarter of a million downloads, which completely blew me away. And not only that, it actually managed to hold on pretty much every store except Japan, five out of five. Japan's 4.5 out of five. And for one day, it actually hit number seven on the Japan app iTunes store, which was just, yeah, I'd, no way. I had no idea about that. That, that was crazy. Anyway, uh, it was too good to last, because at that point, it obviously got way too ho high profile. So I actually got an email from, not Nintendo, but the guys who run Pokemon, and they said, we're not going to comment on the situation with websites and why we'll allow, kind of allow that, or like just turn a blind eye, but we've decided to draw the line at apps, and so could you take it down? So there's obviously like a distinction between having data on a website and data on an app, but they were just like, they were very nice. They explained it in full detail, like a really long email. So I just, yeah, took it down. So might be back sooner or later. I'm going to see if I can work out something with them, but for the time being, it's off the app store for now. Anyway, so with that in mind, let's get onto the awesome, exciting world of you know, app development, iOS dev, and I just wanted an excuse to put a lens flare on an iPhone there. Shiny. I love lens flares. Anyway, so let's start from the very, very beginning. Um, once you've finished the app and you've got the binary all ready, you've got to stick it onto iTunes. And to do that, you've got to do it through iTunes Connect. So really quickly, this is the dialog you'll probably see. It's just a nice... Um, yeah, so basically, it's a nice little form to put all your app information in and hit go. And then once you hit go, it goes into the submission, and you have to hear back from Apple whether it's been approved or denied or not. And once it's on the App Store, that's what it will look like. I'm sure you've all seen that before, right? Once or twice? Cool. So there's probably three main sections you'll probably want to actually look at when you're actually putting the app online. The first one is the app name, which is pretty straightforward. This thing I found out is you know, it has to be absolutely unique. You can't, have any, you can't have two apps on the store with the exact same name. I was actually really lucky because there was already an iPoke Air Dex without the accented E, but not one with the accented E. So I got the one with the accented E, and I was like, yes! So obviously, you know, ASCII characters and Unicode characters are different. Um, so it must be unique. But that being said, if, if the name has been taken, but there isn't an app out there already, you can actually, I've seen a lot of apps do this, you can actually give the app like its name and then have like a little blurb in the app name as well. Like, for example, Tweetbot's actually called Tweetbot, a Twitter client of personality in its app name. Or the other one, what is it, Doodle Jump, warning this game is very, very addictive as its actual app name in the App Store. Um, so you can actually have different names. And it's actually, that's actually really good because you can also use that to add additional, this is probably a bit of a hack, add extra keywords or descriptiveness to your um, app for app searching. So beyond the 100 letter keyword limit, you can actually you know, bait it a bit more of that. Um, I, 
as far as I could tell, I couldn't change it. Apparently in the past you could actually change it pretty easily, but developers are being naughty of this and trying to skew the, um, the order list by calling the app like 000 app name or AAA app name. So Apple put a stop to that by basically locking down the name. And I think you can change it, but it takes a lot of effort. You might have to go straight to Apple and ask. So yeah, so once you've got the app name, if you spelled it wrong, too bad. <laughs> yeah. Keeping it short is a good idea. Like I know you can, you can abbreviate them, but um, on the home screen, you've got like a 10 character limit for the app name. And if you, if you don't have to abbreviate it, it would be nicer. So if you can think of an app name that's really short, that's always a good thing to do. Um, this, this comes up really handy on Twitter um, and other search engines, actually. If you can make a, a name that's really unique, like if it's a name that you can just put into a search engine and, and only your app will come out, that's usually better because that'll make it a lot easier when you're actually doing searches for how well your app's doing down the track. Um, and this is just my personal preference because I'm sick of explaining to people what Foursquare does um, because you, know, you can't actually tell what Foursquare is just by the name. Um, I'm also a pretty big Foursquare user. I'm the mayor of this building and, and the hotel <laughs> <laughs> in the three days I was here. Um, so, but yeah, so if you can have a... <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't have said that. Um, if you can actually have a name that basically you can look at the name and go, oh, I know what that app does straight away, that will actually be a lot easier for people and will probably entice them to try it out a lot quicker. Uh, okay, next you've got the app description. Now, has anyone actually read an app description from start to finish? One and a half? Two? Cool, yeah, okay. Yeah, so I was thinking, well, I was actually, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what would I put, what's a good app description? What can you put in there to make the app look like really fleshed out and professionally done? And I went around and checked out a lot of other apps. Like the Twitter app is like a paragraph, like yay big, and other ones are, you know, reams and reams of volumes. But some things I thought was um, just straight out of the blue. You can change the app description anytime you want, which is cool. So I actually used mine for announcements. If something was coming up or an update was coming out, I'd stick it in the, in the announcement straight away. Just to, I don't know if users really read that on a, on a constant basis, but you know, it makes me feel better. Um, but yeah. Uh, usually, you, you should describe the app, but don't, don't overdo it. Like three sentences is probably enough to get the idea across. And most users will either be like, yeah, that sounds cool, or no, that sounds terrible at that point. After that, you can, um, if the, this is a really nice one, add a, add a list of your main features, the ones you really want to be proud of. So if a user is going through a pile of apps, they're after some specific functionality, but they don't know which one to get, if you can list out features you have that the other apps might not have, that would definitely give yours a bit of an edge over their apps. So if yours is the only one that does like iC iCloud Sync at the moment, then yeah, definitely put that in. Uh, just things like that, things that will definitely make your app stand out against the other apps out there. Um, also, this is a bit of a, a bit of a, you know, tooting your own horn thing. I got a very nice review from Louis, so I put that up in mine, right there. <laughs> and yeah, so basically, you know, if, if people say nice things, it's always good to just say that to say it's, it's, the app's had a bit of recognition. If it's got like you know app of the week or something on Apple, you definitely want to pimp that out as much as you can. So don't overdo it. But one or two, one or two like good reviews is always a good thing to add in there. Um, this is a good one to kind of give stuff back to the users, I, I thought. It was like, my app wasn't finished, like fully, I wasn't like fully finished with the feature set, and a lot of users were now suggesting features. So I thought at the very bottom of the app description, I could put in like a little list saying, I'm still working on it, this is the stuff that's coming out. So if, you, if, you, if you're interested to get the app now and maybe just hang on for these features, this is what's definitely coming. So it's good to have like a little upcoming plan for the app in the description as well. And then at the very end, uh, a lot of apps do this if you want to do it. Just put like a little, I think the last two points go together, like a little email address saying, if it crashes, uh, I, I, let, me, let me tell you, I, I've tested on, on as much, many devices as I, as I can, but if it crashes, you know, come, come talk to us, here's our email address, we'll try and sort you out, so could you do that before you give us a one star review and just, you know, forget about us completely. And yeah, that's just like a little good thing to do. And finally, this one I ballsed up royally the first time, so I thought I'd just let you know about this, the app icon. <coughs> Um, that's not actually the icon from the binary. That's, that's actually a scaled down version of the scaled down version of the 512 pixel one that gets uploaded along with the description. Uh, it can only be changed on updates, which I found out to my frustration when I screwed up the icon and it looked terrible for the first update. Um, so yeah, so if it does look really weird or blurry, that's why. It's not actually the direct copy and paste from your other um, icon, your app's icon. Uh, this is why I screwed it up. So Gloss, apparently, even though the iTunes Connect website says always leave the Gloss off your icon because we'll be putting it in ourselves, apparently if you upload your app with it saying that the Gloss is already put in in the P list, it won't put Gloss on the um, icon when it actually goes up. 
So for that, for the first couple of releases, mine didn't have any gloss, and it looks really weird because it was blown out to try and account for the glossiness. And yeah, I don't want to go there. So just basically remember that if you take, if you've got gloss already in the icon in the app, make sure you already have it in the app icon for the app store as well. Don't worry about round edges. Like everyone's seen like the apps with like the white pixels around the rounded edges, right? In the app store, yeah, yeah, that just looks bad. Yeah, so just don't don't worry about trying to match the curves. Just make the whole thing the same color and like. Apple, the um, App Store will probably just round it off for you on its own. So yeah, just don't, don't do that. And this is just a bit of a personal opinion. Just keep it simple. I've seen some app icons which are just like, you know, 20 megapixel photographs scaled down to 47 pixels. So yeah, yeah it's like most, most good apps are just, you know, without going too much into design, like a nice solid background, a nice simple icon, that's it. All right, so once you've actually sent that email, sent the app off to Apple for review, and you've got that magical email from Apple saying that, your app was rejected for using private APIs. How'd that get? How did that get in there? Yeah. Little tip, guys. If uh, if it's not in a public header, don't write a category to try and call it anyway. Found out. Also, yeah, that was that was for using a, a proprietary UI co UI color class. So any any class is out of bounds. Anyway, so let's forget about that. There we go. And there, that's better. So now your app's ready for sale. So. Where will it appear once it's actually for sale? Now, the sad truth is that um, it probably won't be instantly available. Like, there's no real area that it will it'll appear and users can finally suddenly find out about it. Like, there is in every single category on the App Store a section where recent re released apps comes out, but that that fl flies by, and I doubt no one, I doubt anyone's actually checking these things constantly, saying, "Oh, maybe the app I want might appear in this list." So for the first while, the only way people are actually going to find your app is via the search feature of the App Store. This is where it gets a bit, you know, a bit, you know, it means that people will have to be looking for the functionality your app provides, and so they already have to be on a mission to find this app with, before they actually find it on their own. So that takes me just to app search. Um, now, to actually get your app to appear in search results, updates, um, you actually manually define the keywords that uh, will be used to search for the app. Now, in the past, you, it, it did actually use the, um, the description as well to search for apps, but people were, were making way too much use of this, and they were, they were doing things like putting in the description, if you like Angry Birds, Tiny Wings, Doodle Jump, more like putting every single popular app name in there to try and bait the, the search description to bring your app up. So now it's completely locked down to the app name and to these keywords. So the app name is auto-included, so don't put that in the, in the keywords as well, unless you've got, like, in my case, I had funky lettering, so I thought it'd be a good idea to put it in anyway, just to make sure that if there was non-standard lettering, that you know the, the search would still work. If you put in standard lettering, there is a hundred-letter limit for keywords, so you've got to be really, you know, really concise about the keywords you use and pick pick ones that are really, really um, good for the app. Um, but you basically just want to make it if they search for something, if they're searching for just the functionality of your app, you put in as many synonyms to what what your app actually represents, as opposed to like its name or spins on its name, that kind of thing. So you really just want to drive home what the user is looking for and how you actually want to match that up. Don't use generic keywords. Like I was, I was going around doing a search for good keywords in the App Store and one website was saying things like free and fun and happy and no, that will not work. So just make sure you keep it really concise. The, the user is going to want a specific thing. So if you, if you try and make it like trying to, to bait it so your, your app will appear regardless, that probably won't actually work. And I think because now many apps have done that, it won't actually appear. So yeah, so are you, at this point, users will be looking for something specific. Once it actually gets up the App Store ladder a bit more, they might actually just start finding it for, you know, just, just by happenstance, which is excellent. So that, that opens up a, a much wider market. But until then, if they're look, doing through search, they're looking for something specific. specific. They, they, they've established they want this app, and they're going to just be looking through this specific list for that app. So very, it's a very small market initially. So once you actually get on the App Store and start getting night happy reviews and the likes, you will start off at search, and th in this instance, people will only be actually ser like searching for your app, so you actually may only be exposed to a very small penetration of uh, market share. Once it starts to get a, a, a few good reviews, it might move up to the top category. So if it's like reference apps or games, you might get in there. And this is good because now suddenly people, people just browse through these lists when they're bored. So suddenly you've got an area where people might just happen upon your app. And if the app, app name looks cool and the icon looks cool, they might just check it out. Um, the one that iPokedex made it all the way up to is the top one, and this one is just, people are just on this one constantly from the looks of it. It's just, yeah, if, you're, if they're bored, they're just going through, they're going, ah, oh, any cool new apps? 
So if you make it there, it, like the number of downloads increases significantly because it's just, they might not even know they want an app for, for that, but it's there and in their face. And then, you know, if you, do, if you make it a big time, you'll get to the featured list. But yeah, has anyone actually made it there yet? Nope. Oh, hey, Josh. OK. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All righty. Um, so just to show what, how iPokedex went down, um, when it started off, so can anyone actually tell me when, when it actually hit number seven? There's a slight spike, a really tiny one. You might miss it. But yeah, basically when the app came out around here, it was, it was averaging about 3,000 downloads a day, which was amazing. I was used to one download a day. And then after a while it went down, um, then I released the first patch update, and then it, it basically idled for a bit. In June 1, I actually translated the app to Japanese and actually gave it to the Japanese market. And so then you actually see a little bit of an increase. And then it just took off. I don't know what happened. I'm still trying to figure out what actually caused the catalyst for that. But yeah, it went from 3,000 downloads a day to 30,000 downloads a day for a little while. And then it back, went back down to about 2,000 downloads a day. So I think it was actually just a word of mouth kind of thing. And then when it actually got to the point where on, on, the, on the front page of the store, people just the reviews were saying people were just downloading it because they just saw it and they thought, what the heck, it's Pokemon and it's free. So, yeah. All right, so the app's on the store, but no one knows about it right now. So now we actually have to tell people it's out there without getting blacklisted for spam, which I've also happened, had happened to me. So let's try and do this nice white hat way without you know, getting blacklisted. So the first thing you might want to do, this is, this is a cool thing that lots of apps do, um, is to try and, you know, just a quick question. Has anyone here actually reviewed an app willingly? You know, they download the app. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, let me, like, you got the app, and you're like, this is cool. I, I'm going to give the guy five out of five without any prompting whatsoever. <laughs> oh, geez. Okay. Cool, Tim. A <laughs> couple of you. Okay. I've never done that before. Sorry, guys, if I've got your app. Um, but this is cool little uh, open source library that is out there, and lots of apps use it. It's called... It's basically a little, little, uh, little library that just every now and then, after a, a long period of time, before, when, once the user's established they like the app, will just prompt saying, hey, if you like this app, you want to rate it, and just go to the App Store. Has anyone not seen this at this point? It's on all the main ones, like Angry Birds and Jetpack Joyride and all the, yeah, it's everywhere. It probably should be default iOS functionality. It's an open source library called Apparator. Yeah, OK, Apparator, which is um, on GitHub for free. It's the MIT license, so you can just grab it. And as long as you reference it, you can use it any way you want. Um, it's very unobtrusive. It just it basically waits. It's got like a, a set of conditions, like it waits for a week or it waits for the app being opened 15 times before it actually appears. So it's just a really quick reminder that it only appears once the users really establish that they like the app. Uh, relatively unobtrusive. You can either you know hit rate or hit remind me later, which it does an hour later, or hit no thanks, in which case it never appears again. And it definitely helps out app ratings. Like a lot of my reviews were saying things like, the thing told me to rate it, so here it is, I rated it. God, just shut up already. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so obviously it contributes. I don't know if it's a good thing, but it definitely did help a bit. So I'd, I'd, I'd recommend always put um, app rate into your apps if you want to get like a good, good user base behind it. All right, social spamming, I mean networking. Um, so Russell put on this uh, a little bit earlier today, um, just saying that, it, I don't know, it's, I actually say it helps out a little bit. I mean, at the point of saying it's, it, you know, you've got not, not much to lose, it's good to try and leverage these things as much as you can. So I was going to say that the two main ones are your good old Twitter and your good old Facebook. Um, Twitter is really good because it's a really open public space. You can, um, I set up a hashtag for my app and just every time I made it, I was talking about developing it, I'd tweet about it. Uh, Facebook, I didn't, didn't try and ab use Facebook as an advertising platform because that is a lot of pain and grief and yeah, I keep forgetting to do it and I'm too lazy to do that. If you've got like a, a, a name that your group works under, it might be cool to have like a page about that and just uh, put updates to one main page instead of trying to make a certain uh, like page for every single app. Um, but Twitter's really cool because you know, even if people, you don't think anyone's watching, people are watching all the time. I'll talk about that later. But yeah, just really quickly, don't, don't, if you're going to use these things, don't like advertise them. You should probably like just discuss them. Like I didn't actually say, get my app, get my app, get my app. I'd be like talking about, oh, stupid user defaults are screwing up in my app kind of thing. So just like talking passively about the app and it would actually generate a little bit of interest about that as long as I use the right hashtags. Um, I, I went around and asked pretty much everyone I know to share it and that was actually quite nice. A lot of my good friends actually did go ahead and share it and it actually got a bit of a viral uh, out, outgoing from that. Not too much, but it was, you know, always, everything's, every little bit helps. 
Um, if you are going to start talking about it on social networking, just remember you don't spam it. Don't ever spam it. I've spammed it and it didn't work out. Um, I'd probably say three posts a day tops, maybe more if it's a new release or something. But yeah, just, just remember to be very, very careful about that. Never repeat yourself. So if you, if, you, you know, if you write a tweet about it and you repeat the tweet an hour later, you'll, get, like, you'll lose all your followers like, instantly. I'd, well, maybe not that badly, but you know, pretty, pretty badly. Um, and yeah, that's about it. So the next thing you can do is, who here doesn't have a blog? One, two, okay, so yeah, everyone has a blog. Okay, cool. Yeah, so that's my blog. It's also got, ooh, 70% off bubble tea, cool. Um, yeah, so yeah, a, a blog's just a really good place because A, it generates, it's a, it's a great place where you can um, basically write articles about your, your um, app, which is always really good to actually just promote the app a bit. Um, if you want to talk about some of the underlying technologies you wrote for the app, this is a great place. You can't do that in the social networking space. It's always good to have a blog for this kind of stuff. Um, let's see. So yeah, it helps. So, but, but it also just bolsters Google rankings. So if you, if you start looking for your app on Google rankings, you've got a blog about it, that'll usually appear up first, and it helps just actually solidify the, um, the presence of the blog online. It's a great place for if, if people want to actually come and talk to you about the, the uh, app in a public space, they can just do it in the comments for some of your blogs. And I, I got quite a bit of questions about that in my uh, blog comments. So that's a really good place to a bit, you know, if it's a bit more detailed than social networking will allow, it's a really good like hub you can have. If you have an, an official like team site as well, like a group of you guys making stuff, you can always have a blog there, which is probably standard these days to have. And you know, blogs are very, very easy to set up. I mean, everyone here basically has one, so I don't need to really drive that home. Like WordPress.com and Tumblr, it's all in five seconds. You're done. All right, now. Russell was saying that these don't really work today, but I, I'm, I'm going to say that I think they do, actually, like third-party review sites. So basically, I was going to do some research to see which, one, which ones were the best, but I just did a single Google search for app review sites, and I got a wall of websites. It was like every single front page was like a link to 10 more review sites. Yeah, spamming, 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 yep. Yeah. But yeah, there are tons out there. And as long as you don't pay money, um, you've got nothing to lose putting your app on these app sites. And from what I've seen, I put my app on maybe three. These, these um, sites, or at least similar ones, they actually seem to watch each other. So if one app appears on one, it actually starts to propagate to others, which is really curious. And all of a sudden, I actually had blogs blogging about my app that I had never told or anything. So I'm actually thinking that these are really good just because they actually have like a, a weird viral cascading effect where the app will actually get a bit more prolific online just from doing a little bit of effort. But, uh, but yes, but since there's nothing to lose, I definitely recommend, even if it's just, just as a little bit of a boost, to always just submit your app to as many review sites as you can. Um, to do that, I'd recommend, the, just, just really quickly to actually say how it works, you should always have like a, a nice statement prepared to describe the app. Like the, the first thing they'll always ask is like, what does the app do? You could probably copy it from the description of the app, or you could just make a really nice press release style kind of one. Um, make sure the app is ready. Uh, my first iteration crashed horribly on iPod Touch 2 generations, and that would not have looked good on any kind of reviews. So just make sure, uh, it's probably a good idea to wait to like version 1.1 or some version of your app just to make sure it's rock solid and any, any weird teething problems are out of the way. So you're going to get good scores in your reviews. Um, some might actually charge money. I'd probably recommend staying away from them. They might try and say that they're really, really, you know, it's worth giving us money so we'll review your app. But that's probably just a weird money grubbing scheme. So maybe just try and stay away from those. You can try it if you want. Let me know how it goes. But yeah, just keep an eye on that. Um, they're not going to buy your app so they can review it. So you've got to actually go into iTunes Connect and generate some keys so they can get your app for free. Um, and there's usually just a little field saying, if app is free, um, if is paid, insert key here in the submission form. And yeah, they might think your app is a heap of crap, in which case, get ready, <laughs> get ready for a bit of um, you know, self-esteem destruction. But yeah, just in case. Um, another thing, this is something Russell touched on this morning, and I actually thought it was really good. Um, if you actually make it look like, well, not make it look like, you know, indicate that the app is, you know, people are caring about the app. There's actually a human presence behind the app. And one of them is, one of those really great ways to do that is just to update it pretty often. Like, um, basically what I thought when I was making the app is I, I want to get everything done and in one lump and then put the app out and forget about it. But I realized I was going to be in development for months upon months if I was going to do that. So I thought I'll lock it down to a relatively specific scope at the, at the beginning. There's a lot of stuff I can be adding, but I can put that in later, and just get it out and do incremental updates. So I went 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, just went through and added 
everyone just added one of, one of the features on my list. And that was really good because um, that actually generated a lot of hype. People were going, oh, new, new updates coming out. And, and like, oh, well, people are actually still working on this. It's not vaporware. So, and that actually just really helps to actually just solidify the app is alive. It's changing. If you want, you can give, you, give us your input, and we'll actually take your input into consideration. Um, so yeah, so it's so just a matter of you know, incremental updates. So the app doesn't actually have to be completely finished first time around. Um, it makes the users feel more involved if they actually have a, a helping hand in the um, actual shaping of the new feature set of the updated versions. In fact, I think this is why Minecraft is so popular, because this is a model that Minecraft does. I've been hearing that um, it's becoming a, a community event, basically, with a lot of people involved on it, a lot of people suggesting it. And it's just been going on for so long in beta and alpha. It's, it's nearly out. Awesome. And, but yeah, it's just, it's just a, a kind of like a, an evolving group kind of thing. It's, like a, it's not really a static entity. It's always changing. And yeah, so it just basically feels, feels like the app is, you know, once, once an app has ceased development, you, you can usually feel it's ceased development. So it, it's great because it, it makes the app feel a lot more alive than some of the other apps out there in the App Store. Um, this is something I learned from the guy, one of the dudes who made the incident, Matt Comey, um, probably a very popular um, iPhone app. But he said a great thing he did when he was actually setting up marketing for his app was uh, a newsletter. So just putting like a, little, a little text field on his, on his app's website or his, his company's website, just saying, when the app's ready, We'll, uh, we'll let you know. So give us your email address and we'll, we'll pass along, along once it's finished, which is a really good, really good thing to do because it's, we can set up on the, on the site or in the app if you want to like, you know, continue receiving updates for the app. Uh, you can send out alerts easily. Um, it's just really cool because you're actually building your own user base then. So up, up in future, maybe for other apps, if they're okay with it, you can actually start sending updates for other apps like that can be used for future projects. So you can actually start building your own user base and using that to promote your own app, ne like next apps coming out. So now the actual task of getting the word out is a lot easier ne around the track. All right. But that being said, newsletters must be used very responsibly. Otherwise, you're a dirty, dirty spammer. So I think Matt was actually saying he was using a special system where you actually had to go through an approval process saying, I'm going to tell my users this, this, and this. And they wouldn't actually let him send out the email until they actually said, OK, yeah, that's not spam. Yeah, you can do it kind of thing. And it, it's also very, very strict time-wise. You can't send emails once per day, like more than once per day or something like that. All right, and this is, um, this is something that um, really blew me away. It was uh, completely unexpected. But Easter eggs. Has anyone actually put Easter eggs in their apps? Anyone considered it? A couple? Cool, OK. So I'm just going to get my app up here. Um, I actually, just as a bit of a, bit of a, bit of a lolzy kind of thing, um, there's this cool guy on the internet called Ego Raptor. Does anyone know about him? A couple people know? Oh, that's sad. Um, either way, he made a really hilarious video where he was just... Oh, look, it told me that I should rate my app right now. Um, <laughs> no, thanks. Um, he, he actually made a hilarious video where he was just making funny Pokemon noises, and he... I thought it was so hilarious, I thought I'd put it into my app as an Easter egg. So it's a guess to recognize if you tap the screen five times, all right, well, it just yells out, Charmander, in this really, really weird voice. Oh, there it is. Yeah, we got it working. I chose you, Charmander. Oh, so it's just ludicrous, right? <laughs> but, but hilarious. So that was just a little bit of fun, just because I, I wanted to screw enough UI guest recognizes. But I left it in there, and it went out to the App Store. And someone found it. I don't know what they were doing. Just like, just going, yeah, app, where, I don't know, something. But they found it. And it scared the hell out of them. Because <laughs> they, they weren't expecting that. And so they, they jumped on the App Store and went, guys, guys, if you do this thing, it, it makes funny noises. And then people were going, really? So then they started getting the app to check it out. Then it jumped to Twitter. So people were going, hey, if you get iPokedex, it makes this funny noise if you tap one screen, you know. And then people on Twitter are going, what's iPokedex? It actually started a, a cascading viral effect because of a, of a hidden feature, like an Easter egg. And it actually jumped a bit. And that, I had no idea that was even possible. But yeah, if, I guess I'm just going to say, if you want to try it out, Easter eggs are actually a, a, a subtle viral motivation kind of factor for an app. You know, they're supposed to be harmless fun. So you don't actually you know, do anything malicious with them. Um, I did actually read that there might actually be a little bit of risk behind Easter eggs because they're, they're undocumented functionality. So it's probably a good idea to tell Apple in, like, when you're submitting the app that the Easter egg is there. Um, it is hilarious if someone actually finds it. So if you actually set it up in such a way that someone might accidentally find it, um, <laughs> it's really funny to watch. Like, like, I, like I said to mine, it can potentially go viral just because of the sheer 
like someone, someone found something cool and un, un, you know, undocumented and so actually have, their, their first goal was to tell everyone they know. And yeah, it's just, it helps establish the fun. As the app is a bit of fun. Like I'm not taking the thing serious. This isn't a corporate business buddy by app. It's a very fun app. So there's going to be lots of funny little things in there. Okay, and that's it for actually getting that, the, the app out there. So once the app's out there, we actually want to start tracking how the app is doing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about app tracking metrics, which is pretty cool. So we've got um, iTunes Connect, and iTunes Connect comes you know, automatically with your app submission. That's provided by Apple. Now, there's a lot of data in iTunes Connect. It's really good data. But the problem is, is it's, it's pretty good, but it, you could be doing a lot more of the data than what iTunes Connect is exposing to you. So just to, to help that along, I learned this from um, the dude who went on to make the Discover Music app. So this is, this is like really up there, I think. It's a really cool online web service called appfigures.com. Has anyone heard of appfigures before? Anyone? Oh, yep, just one. <laughs> okay, cool. So AppFigures is this really cool web service. Um, basically what you do is you sign up with them, you put in your iTunes, uh, your Apple ID and your password, and basically what AppFigures then does is on a daily basis it goes through your account, grabs all the information and passes it and stores it in its own local store. And it's really cool because it actually provides a lot more functionality for um, actually getting at that data and seeing what it actually represents. So things like being able to segregate based on time, like regional downloads, at any given moment, like in the world, and this, this is updated on, on a daily basis, and that's really cool. The coolest thing I like about it, because this is, this is somewhat lacking in, um, well, really lacking in iTunes Connect, is the ability to actually aggregate and then look at every single user review in one main list yes. in any language. And not only that, this is in Japanese, not only that, it actually has a tweet. Uh, what the hell? Uh, it actually has built in Google Translate. So you can also just go in, hit Translate to English, and suddenly all your reviews are in English. So that's, yeah, on iTunes Connect, you have to do it per version, per region, one at a time. So, so yeah, it's, that, that, that could use a bit of work. But yeah, so this basically just aggregates all together. And you can actually see all your reviews straight there in either the original language or in English. Usually bad English if it's translated, but what, what are you looking at? <laughs> oh, OK. That's talking about the gender ratio. Yeah, yeah, okay, you got it. <laughs> I didn't actually see that before. <laughs> All right. That's an Easter egg. Yeah, that's an Easter egg. Well spotted. Yeah, completely, yeah. Anyway, so that's appfigures.com. Um, I totally recommend it. it. It's cool because it actually saves a local copy of all the iTunes Connect data. So every now and then, I think iTunes actually, if a new version goes out, it actually deletes older, I might need to check this, it actually deletes, deletes older version data for your app. But AppFigures stores all of it on its own servers, so you can actually get access to all of it at any time. Uh, it lets you filter download sales by basically anything you want. You can filter by update ratio, download ratio, by region, specific time area, a whole pile of really cool stuff. And it's all completely Ajax powered, so it's just one page and just completely refreshing on its own. Um, you can aggregate all your user reviews into one giant list, which is really cool to go through and see what everyone in the world's talking about your app, whether it be nice or sometimes with uh, really badly translated swear words. Um, uh, and it also lets you then, you know, completely inline set Google uh, Translate to actually go through and translate those reviews. So if you don't speak every language in the world, it doesn't really matter. Uh, unfortunately, it's not free. I wish it was, but it's five bucks a month. And I seriously, it's I, I just factor that into my um, the revenue I generate off my other app to pay that off because it's totally worth it. Okay, so that's online tracking. Now, what about when you're actually you've actually got the app on your phone? and you're using your phone, yeah, you guy using the phone. Um, well, a guy, anyway. Um, the guy using the phone. <laughs> so yeah, so we've got when people download the apps off iTunes, but what about actual usage metrics? Now, there's nothing actually in there already, but it is possible to actually track people using your app as opposed to people downloading your app. And there's a lot of um, services out there. What was the one you, asked, you told me about on Facebook, Louis? Flurry, okay, yep, so it's Flurry. The one I ended up using just because I'm lazy and already had the account was Google Analytics. Okay, um, Google Analytics. So basically it treats the app kind of like, it's a, it's, a, it's a singleton library that just drops into your app as a framework and it, it basically treats your app like a website. So you, you can treat view controllers as pages, you can treat everything else as the way like a website actually works, except it's an app. And as long as you don't actually reference the hardware that it's being run on, um, because this, uh, it, Apple's okay with it. And the reason for that is because apparently back in the old, the old days, 
while hardware tracking was still allowed, um, some guys actually got a log from Apple when they were testing apps on the iPad before the iPad was announced. And so they were going, whoa, guys, Apple's using some kind of new iOS device. And Apple didn't like that. So, uh, so as long as you don't track the hardware, Apple's totally cool with it. Uh, and it's really good, because you can actually then see, get a gauge of actually how the app is doing in terms of usage. Because once, once it's downloaded, that's the end of it you hear from iTunes Connect. But this actually gets to see people still using it, when they use it, which countries are still using, are using it the most, what's the most active usage time. Funnily enough, it's every Saturday and Sunday. Who would have thought? Um, every single loading of a view controller ever. <laughs> is that number there? Um, yeah, that was a bit funky. Um, yeah. So basically, what you, what you do is actually just set like a little marker that whenever they load a view controller, it um, just what I did was I set it so it gives each controller a name and then just sends, sends Google Analytics the name of that controller. So these are like all the, all the main use, used view controllers in the app. Funnily enough, the home screen is the most accessed one. But yeah. And that's really cool. That's, that's some really good information there. And I can actually use that to try and gauge which, app, which, versions, uh, which screens I should focus on more and if there's any other ones that people really aren't looking at, if I need to try and direct more attention, just all that kind of stuff. That's Google Analytics. Uh, so it's really cool. It's completely local. Uh, so it doesn't actually rely on any out, out external um, systems to actually work. Um, it can be tailored to track anything you want. So you can actually just put in anything, anything you want to actually set up in a dispatch event to send to Google Analytics. Um, the only stipulation Google has for you using it is that you must actually say somewhere in the app that you're using um, you know, analytics software and that it's, you know, it's not tracking anything private, all the, all the normal privacy policy stuff. So it's exactly the exact same thing as a website. Um, you might, if you want, you can add an opt-out feature. I chose not to. I was, I was going to if people were kick, kicking, kicking up a stink, but they didn't, so that was OK. Um, this, how it actually works is it actually aggregates all the dispatch events into little, um, little uh, packages and sending them off. So it's not constantly spamming the 3G modem. So it actually doesn't really affect battery life as long as you're careful with it. And finally, keep it classy. You can track every single thing the user does in the app. That doesn't mean you should, but just, you know, so with a great power comes great responsibility. Make sure you track as much as you would need, but not as much as you really want. So I didn't actually, I could have tracked like every single search keyword that the, the users put into my app or something like that, but I chose not to. All right. Engaging the users. Okay. So this is just basically, as Russell was saying this morning, support, more or less. So. Once reviews start coming in, there might be some reviews you don't really agree with. Like, you know, people, people will always say stuff like, this app sucks. And they won't say why, or how, or what hardware they're on, what iOS version they're on. And unfortunately, on the App Store, there's no way to actually get to those users. They'll say something, that's it. You can't talk to them. You can't, yeah, can't ask why it sucks or whatever. So you can't really use that as much of a, a user engagement sort of thing. Um, in terms of support, though, if you want to put like a, a really quick and easy way for people to actually get, get at you, apart from putting the email in the app description, you can also put it as a link in your side of your app. So it's all of three lines of code to actually spawn a, a mail controller. So you should always at least have at one part in your app something that users can quickly just tap that and then write in really quickly. Like, yeah, your app sucks, lol, lol, lol omfg, yeah, et cetera. And, that sends, and it gets sent off quite a lot. And that, I get a crazy pile of emails through that. I get like one or two a day of people asking me things about the, the app, mainly through that. So that's, that's probably my main stream of our contact. So when people ask for new features or whatever, it usually comes through here. And it's tied up straight to our, our Google inbox. We can all answer to it. And yeah, and that's just it. So if we, get, if we get an email through that, we'll say, thanks for your email. We'll, we're working on that feature. Or no, you're crazy, go away, kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's all of three lines of code. So there's no reason you shouldn't have at least some kind of contact mechanism inside your app. Um, that's a blank, blank slide. OK. All right, that's what I was supposed to talk here. Um, another thing I found out, this is cool. Um, this is a little th something I stole from someone else. Um, a little while ago, some guys from O'Reilly Media made a book about Twitter. It was called The Twitter Book. Right. And it was, it was a really nice book. I read it to its entirety, and I was like, that's awesome. Now I know how to use Twitter and like, tweet and stuff. And then, I, I, ironically enough, I tweeted about it. I went, wow, The Twitter Book is awesome. And, and five minutes later, I got a uh, tweet back from the author of the book saying, hey, Tim, glad you liked the book. And I was just like, holy crap. <laughs> so this is why I was talking about having a unique app name. So what I did this time um, is I actually set up a hashtag, or just, just a, a search, a, a, a specific list in TweetDeck and in TweetBot and all that to actually constantly scan for my app name. And if people are going, wow, this app is awesome, or this app sucks because it keeps crashing on my iPhone 1 or something like that, I could actually jump in and say, hey, thanks for using the app. Or, oh, really? Oh, 
could you could you send me like a crash report or something like that? So I just you know, and it, it just blows people people's minds because they don't really expect people to be watching them. So the number of of like responses which was just like, who are you <laughs> kind of kind of stuff was just it was just really because it was like a troll fest as well. It was hilarious. Um, so that's actually from the Japanese localization. I'll talk about that in a bit. But yeah, so um, and that was really cool because I actually had a lot of people actually talk like just ranting about why, why features were broken and stuff. And I could actually either, if it was something I could fix with them, like tell them if you go into the settings and change that, or if it was something like I'm working on it, next release, I swear, kind of thing, I could actually engage directly with the users outside of the App Store and most of the time sort out what, what kind of problems they're having with. So that was, a re that was actually another really cool medium for actually getting back in touch with the users. And it also freaked them out because don't, you don't really realize that people are watching you on Twitter, always, always watching. Big brother. All righty. And yeah, you're always going to get trolls on the internet. Uh, my favorite review I actually got was like, it's just a website in app form. One star. <laughs> I'm sure the user was making this face while he was uh, writing that app. <laughs> always happens. <laughs> I was like, yeah, really? You gotta just... And that's it. That's all I heard from the guy. But I'm thinking, if you're going to get criticism. You can try and be the nicest guy in the world. You can try and you know, bend to your, the user's will as much as possible. You can bend over backwards. One guy was like, You've done the Pokemon games, but could you, could you add the card game as well, like in with the game? <laughs> and I was like, nah. So, it, you know, you're going to get like, people are always going to be upset with something. You can try and fix them all. You can try and keep everyone happy, but there's going to be a point, I think Apple does its best. Just, just figure out what everyone really needs as opposed to what everyone wants and stick with that. Um, if you do have the, the communication channels to talk to them, just remember like, like what Russell was saying before, the Wheaton's, Wheaton's first law. Just be really polite, ask what, what's wrong. Like I had one guy who was raging about it and I asked him why is he raging about it and he said, well, it doesn't do this, 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 and this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and like listed off a huge pile of Pokemon algorithmic metrics. And I actually went back and researched and went, oh, he's right. So I actually went and added it into the next app release and told him about that. And he was actually, he changed his tone completely. He was really happy about that. So, you know, if, if, if the avenue persists, like, you know, just try and, try and be nice to them, try and clarify, you know, see if, you know, see if they still want to be a meanie to, to your own face. Most of the time they don't, they're just raging at, at, at the air. Um, but if, it, if, you know, if all else fails, just forget about it. It, it will happen, so don't, don't let it ruin your day. All right, and my final section of the app talk is localization. This is something I was screwing around with from the beginning. Um, has anyone actually thought about localizing their apps to other languages? Yep, cool, there's a little bit, cool. So um, I've been doing Japanese for a few years now. I lived in Japan for a year, and I do this really cool after-school tutorial thing called Kumon. So I thought, well, what the heck? I'm going to try. And tr I'm going to try. It might be impossible. It might be really hard. But I'm going to try and translate this thing to Japanese. So localization. So it's actually really easy to translate apps to other languages on the iOS store. It's like NS localized string, and that's it. Um, and it was obviously it was, getting, it was becoming very apparent that other people really wanted the app to be in their respective languages. I was getting reviews on app f figures about this. And I actually went into the App Store with a very bigoted Western view that since the iPhone is a US device, it's a very you know, Western kind of thing, surely the main market is people who speak English, or it's like English is at least their second language. So I was thinking, will it actually be worth my, will it actually be tangible gains to, to get from actually lo spending the time and effort to localize an app and then actually start the whole process of like getting the, the word out there in another language? So I, I spent a month, I took the app, I redesigned some elements so they fit Japanese words and, and just read all the graphics using Japanese characters and all that. And I called the app Aizukan, which is Japanese for iPokedex, funnily enough, and stuck it out there. And let's see. And this is basically what happened. Um, so that was it. That was like the number of Japanese downloads I had before the localization. And if you can see the number, it's, uh, it's like 100 a day. So it was like you know, 10% of the downloads are from Japan, and then um, after that, as you heard before, it went, it became number seven. So it jumped to a couple of thousand a day, and then jumped to 30,000 a day. And that was just Japan. And so by the by the end of the uh, the whole experience, more than half of total downloads was exclusively from Japan. So you had like you know Europe, Australia, uh, America, <laughs> like every single country in the world, and then Japan. So obviously it was definitely worth localizing it. There was a huge demand for it, probably because of the you know because of the source material. But um, yeah, I was actually blown away. I was like, I was like, no one in Japan would have an iOS device, but looks like they do. 
just a, a fair few. So yeah, so from now on, I'm actually thinking that localization is totally worth it. If you can actually spare the resources and the time to do it, I would definitely would recommend it because there is obviously a huge market out there, much bigger than just the English speakers, for app usage. So just in terms of localization, yes, it's totally worth it. If you can, you should do it. Um, it does indeed open up app exposure quite more. Like if you, if you actually thought there, there wasn't any point to doing it, there is definitely a point to doing it. It may require design changes, um, depending on, the, on your, like some languages, you know, flip the reading direction. Uh, in my case, the Japanese font actually rendered like four pixels above the English font, so everything looked really screwy initially. So you've got to actually factor in like a lot of things will change when you actually translate to a different language. Um, one thing was like, this is really interesting. Like the, the Japanese don't actually have a fair use clause in their copyright. So while, while what I was doing here was in a legal gray area in terms of using the Pokemon copyright, in Japan it was downright illegal. And so people were going, wow, this guy is either really hardcore or really stupid. Oh my God, he's going to get raped in jail. And, rah, 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 rah. and I was just like, I was just like, oh man. So I was like, oh wow, okay. So obviously depending on like your culture, um, was like you, you're definitely being brought up with different laws in effect than other people. You actually get extremely differing reviews sometimes, like opinions. So uh, yeah, <laughs> didn't expect that. I was actually quite scared for a little bit there. Anyway, um, and yeah, just finally, um, it's, I, I can I can like handle like Japanese bug reports coming in more or less with Google Translate's help. But if I did any other language, I'd probably be screwed. Like if I could, like it's someone in German saying it's like this menu is broken. I don't think I could actually cope with it. So. Um, keeping in mind, if you want to support it in other languages, you're going to have to set up the uh, infrastructure for it. So, uh, yeah. And that's it. That's my speech. Thanks for attending, guys. <laughs> oh. We've got five minutes, so if there are any questions. Yes? Did you ever consider putting ads on the free one? On the free one? Yes, I actually made two versions. Uh, I made the full one, which is a dollar. And then a little while later, I'm, I, I thought I'd try out iAds, so I made a, an iAds specific one called it a light version. And iAds isn't good. Like, I, I'm, get, I'm getting more downloads with the free one with iAds, but the return is like three cents a day on a good day. So I've made, I made, I made enough money to sustain an app developer program with a paid app, but I've, made, I've almost made enough money to buy myself a small latte with the free version. So, so I'm thinking at this point, if you want to go with either uh, a paid app or a free app with ads, I'd probably just you know, stick to your guns and go over a paid app because it'll, you know, it'll, it, it, it will give you better returns in the end. It makes it feel a lot nicer. Any other questions? Yes, Louis? Moving slightly away from the app development side, did you consider maintaining your iPokedex blog in Japanese as well? Considered it. Um, I actually have a profile on, a, on basically Japanese Facebook called Mixi, and I was actually doing a little bit about that. But I found out trying to discuss programming code in Japanese was way beyond my ability, so it would have been like really bad English, but on the Japanese side. <laughs> but yeah, a little bit of that, and there was actually a good bit of user feedback and interaction from that. You said you gave the Japanese localization a different name. Did yeah. You do that? Yeah, you can. So when you actually go into iTunes Connect, you can actually say, add new localization, and that will give you the option to actually specify an app name, <coughs> app keywords, and app description in each respective language. So you can actually do that, and it will, it will appear in iTunes Connect as that language in that specific app store. So depending on what account the Apple ID is tied to will depend on what will appear when you do a search of that Apple ID. Yep? Did you have any experience with picking the, well, right price? Because it has an impact as well. The right price? Well, well for, the, for that one, I made it free because I knew if I charged for it, I would get sued really quickly. Um, but it's, it's really hard, isn't it? Because like, like Russell was saying, it's been, it's been a race to the bottom. So unless you give it 99 cents, like charge 99 cents for it, people are going to start going, wow, $2, this is outrageous. What are trying to drive me? So it's really hard. Like I, I would assume if you, depending on how much you think it's worth, you can always try and see if, if people will go for it. I mean, there are, there are successful apps out there like OmniGrapher, which are being charged like, what, 60 bucks, and they're doing really well. So, you know, if you make it out that your app is worth the amount you're asking for, I'm sure people will still be happy with buying it. Anything else? All right, well, um, if you want to talk to me later, there's my email address on Twitter. I'm sure you've been seeing me spamming the, the dev world hashtag, more or less. But uh, yeah, anyway, thanks a lot, guys, and I hope you enjoyed the conference. Thanks, Tony. <laughs>